good evening one and all uh, first of all i would like to welcome uh, prasanna ramamurthy the principal system engineer from colings aerospace and uh, i would like to welcome uh, the coordinator from uh, uh, aerospace engineering association iit madras those uh, this lecture is uh, organized in association with aerospace engineering association iit madras so i would like to welcome him also and uh, most importantly the participants this uh, event for this event more than 1000 participants from various part of the nations have been registered and i would uh, like to invite you all for this wonderful session and uh, over here uh, i request uh, first of all i will introduce who is the prasanna ramamurthy sarets so the eminent person which who is along with us right now is he is received his bachelor's degree from electronics and communication engineering university of madras chennai and he has completed his masters in avionics from mit chennai as well as he started to work as an system engineer in parts controls and communications he also worked in com avia systems and airbus defense and space as as an system engineer for aircraft mission management system he also worked for drdo projects when he was working in com avia for the upgradation of avionics for mix 27 and sugoi 30 he was awarded as performance excellence award he received actually he received performance excellence award from drdo for his contribution towards mig 27 avionics upgradation he has six us patents and three international publications apart from that he is a member in sae health monitoring vehicle health monitoring membership he is having as well as uh, he is a develop uh, currently he is working on development of aerospace recommended practices for validation of integrated vehicle health monitoring so once again sir i would like to welcome you thank you for accepting uh, it's been a long time uh, the uh, we have requested you for this presentation and finally the day, the day has came today so i give the session uh, i request you to start the session yeah thank, thank you kishan so good evening all of you uh so it is uh, really overwhelming to see uh, so many participants for this webinar and uh, first of all i would like to thank uh, uh, the wing of arrows and the uh, iit aerospace engineering association for organizing this webinar series and uh, so i think uh, apart from this they are also conducting uh, webinar series on multiple other topics Uh, so i would like to congratulate them and uh, appreciate their efforts in uh, spreading and promoting the the aerospace uh, engineering among the students community as well as uh, the industry practitioners so with those words uh, i would like to get started with this presentation and so today's topic uh, is uh, avionic architectures and data buses and uh, so i guess uh, the majority of the participants uh, for today's session are uh, primarily from the aerospace background uh, but i also understand uh, there are uh, some participants from uh, the other domains as well and also from the industry so for the benefit of uh, people from non aero background uh, so i would like to uh, start with a little background on the the aircraft systems engineering and uh, so then uh, gradually get into the the avionics and the avionics architectures and data buses so which is the main theme of the presentation so uh, since the right brothers uh, flew the first flight uh, with the the first aircraft uh, that was uh, designed in the history of aviation in 1903 so we have come a long way so if you see here so the aviation technology has evolved over a period of time and it has gone through various uh, phases uh, somewhere really difficult phases too and somewhere uh, really uh, uh, explosive phases wherein the, the technology development happened uh, in a very rapid manner 
and so finally we are in the modern era of the aviation so where uh, we have uh, we have been experiencing the modern uh, aircrafts like airbus 350 380 and uh, boeing 787 uh, with uh, all the luxury and comfort uh, which are provided to the passengers and uh, so the great flight experience they provide and apart from that so we also have uh, some of the best in class uh, the fighter and the military uh, aircrafts so which are uh, capable of performing uh, uh, some of the missions which are thought to be impossible in the past uh, just to take some example so we have the joint strike fighter which is considered to be the most advanced uh, the fighter aircraft in the world developed by the the us uh, department of defense and we also have uh, other aircrafts like uh, uh, the mig 35 and uh, so the light combat aircraft which is being developed by the indian defense but if you see the evolution of this so there are uh, uh, different uh, phases which are uh, worth to be highlighted over here and so when the Wright brothers uh, designed the first aircraft and uh, they flew their first flight and thereafter uh, uh, they went on uh, conducting a lot of uh, 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 recreational shows. I Means so they went to different places and uh, demonstrated their invention uh, by in terms of uh, the demonstrative flights. And uh, so many others followed their uh, footprints. And uh, so they came up with uh, different designs and they also followed the same trend of uh, uh, conducting different air shows in different parts of the country and in fact in different parts of the world. Uh, but since then, so the aircrafts have found uh, a variety of applications. So not uh, just for the recreation. So they started uh, finding their applications in the military to start with. Then uh, so they were uh, evolved uh, to accommodate uh, a smaller number of passengers and uh, they were operated between uh, short distances from uh, one city to another city and uh, then again their range was extended to cover the uh, airspace between the countries and uh, finally the continents so that way so they uh, they could cover the entire world through the evolution of the aviation, aviation technology. And uh, so in this evolution, I would like to uh, highlight a phase, uh, so which saw uh, an explosive growth of uh, under innovation that took place in the aviation technologies history. So that is the time of the two world wars. So we, also, we all have heard about the World War I and World War II, so which actually caused a lot of uh, uh, damage and loss to human life and uh, uh, and it uh, its influence is uh, and its uh, effects are still felt so even after uh, uh, a century of those wars but uh, from the technology standpoint so this is a, a period during which a lot of technological advancements happen not only in the aviation so even in other domains like electronics communication and uh, the mechanical engineering and uh, aircraft structures and uh, rocket technology. So most of the major uh, uh, evolutions and uh, technological innovations happened during this period. So uh, there is a saying that uh, today's defense technology is tomorrow's commercial technology. So the reason was mainly uh, the all the innovations uh, that happened during World War uh, was primarily in the uh, the defense technology, which was ultimately flown down to uh, the various uh, uh, commercial applications. So, so the the civil aviation that we see here again it is an offspring of uh, whatever innovation that happened uh, in the defense scenario during those uh, two world wars. And so that way, the, the defense technology dominated for quite some time the, the technology world. But uh, during the last few decades, so uh, maybe to start with 1980s, this trend slowly started re reversing. So actually, the, the commercial technology slowly took over the dominance and uh, the, co the commercial systems 
that were, which were developed for the industry started finding applications in the military domain. So that way, so the, the commercial world slowly started establishing their dominance. But irrespective of that, there are uh, few uh, technology domains so, uh, which are still dominated by the, the, the military uh, community. So just to give some example, uh, the radar systems technology and the communication technology, so even the cyber security, so uh, are being dominated by, and a lot of innovations are happening primarily in the military domain. Even though uh, there are parallels in the civil world, so the dominance uh, is uh, still with the, the military community. So that way we can say that, uh, so the, it is important to understand, so how the, this technological evolution uh, took place in the history of aviation in the military domain and uh, how it has flown down to the uh, civil aviation. So this technology evolution, evolution is primarily defined by uh, the purpose for which the aircraft is being uh, used. So we discussed about a lot of applications now. So it started with the recre recreation purpose. Then uh, it was used for the wars as the fighter aircrafts. Then it, uh, yes. Yes, yes, I, yes, I'm still in the first slide, Kishan. So I, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so, so what defines an aircraft primarily is uh, the purpose for which it is being used. And the entire aircraft is conceptualized and built around this purpose. So in the aviation terminology or in the military terminology, we call this uh, the purpose as a mission. So the mission of the aircraft. So uh, the starting point for uh, designing an aircraft is uh, to define its mission uh, as a first step. So in terms of usage, so we can see so these are the, some of the examples of uh, uh, the various missions for which the aircrafts are de uh, designed. Uh, so we all know that the passenger transport, the primary mission of this the passenger transport aircraft is to um, safely displace or the transport uh, the people from one place to another place with uh, the reasonable level of comfort. Similarly, in the military scenario, so we can find a lot of uh, uh, missions which are uh, assigned to different aircrafts. And in, in fact, the aircrafts are uh, dif uh, designed for, uh, differently for uh, different missions. Uh, just to give some examples here, so some of the aircrafts are primarily meant for uh, the air to ground attack. So basically to attack the targets with the bombs and uh, other air to ground weapons like rockets and missiles. And uh, so another example is the close air support. So these aircrafts are primarily meant for supporting the, the ground forces. So whenever the army and the air force conduct the joint operations, so it is a standard practice for the aircrafts to um, uh, lead the uh, mission and uh, they go in the go to the enemy territory first of all and cause the maximum damage that is possible and they also provide the situational awareness uh, what is the current scenario of the enemy territory to the ground forces based on which the, the ground forces uh, penetrate and uh, execute their mission in the enemy territory so this is another example similarly so we have uh, uh, different other missions like uh, performing the surveillance and search and rescue operations and uh, the military transport. So apart from the fighter operations, we also have transport aircrafts in military, so which are meant for uh, transporting uh, weapons, uh, the troops, and uh, different other uh, cargoes from one place to another place uh, in a uh, tactical environment. And uh, so finally, we have the multi-role combat aircrafts. So we, so far we discussed uh, various uh, specific missions like air to ground bombing and the air to air attack. And so there are uh, uh, the modern fighter aircrafts which are designed to um, perform uh, 
many of these operations, a single air, aircraft capable of performing uh, many of these operations. So it may not be uh, simultaneously, and depending on the need, uh, the aircraft could be configured uh, and uh, prepared for uh, any of these missions. So that way, so if you see here, so that the missions uh, defined the aircraft's uh, capabilities and uh, also its final design. So we discussed that so that the, from the missions, so the, uh, the aircraft's uh, 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 configuration and the designs are defined. And so what are the technologies? What are the underlying technologies which define uh, the aircraft's uh, configuration and design uh, to enable them to perform these missions? So uh, we can uh, highlight these six technologies, what is being presented to you as the basic underlying technology. It is irrespective of whether it is a civil aircraft or a military aircraft and uh, irrespective of the mission that is being assigned to it. But when, you, when we get into the details of this, so there will be uh, differences how these technologies are used for def uh, designing different products and systems uh, to perform those missions. So that may be uh, a different uh, topic of discussion. But at the high level, if you see here, so these are the six technologies which uh, influence the design of uh, any aircraft. So the first one is the structures and aerodynamics. So this primarily deals with uh, the design of the aircraft structure, including the fuselage, wings, and uh, so the control surfaces, and also the interiors. And uh, it also includes the nozzles, which hold the, uh, the engines of the aircraft. And uh, the structures have to be designed in such a way that uh, they are capable of withstanding the various aerodynamic loads which are experienced by the aircraft uh, while performing these different missions. So depending on the mission of the aircraft, uh, its flight envelope varies. So when we say flight envelope, basically it means the, altitude, the maximum altitude at which the air, aircraft will be able to fly and the, the maximum speed and uh, the maneuverability of the aircraft. So what is the... Uh, rate at which it can turn, take the turn, the rate at which it can bank, the rate at which it can pitch up or pitch down. So, so all these parameters define the flight envelope of the aircraft, which is again dictated by the mission. So the, the structure uh, of the aircraft should have the sufficient strength to uh, withstand the the various aerodynamic loads and forces, which it is subjected to during uh, different phases of uh, these missions within the defined flight envelope. So the next comes the propulsion. So which is uh, like the heart of the aeroplane. So the, the propulsion uh, is enabled by the engine, which we generally call as power plant. The engine is uh, always linked with the the electrical power system, which is uh, on board, which uh, provides the power supply to various uh, electrical equipment on board. So the engine provides the thrust uh, that is required for uh, uh, moving the aircraft in the forward direction. And uh, so indirectly, uh, this is the one which is responsible for producing the necessary lift. So the engine's uh, specifications define uh, the capability, apart from the structure, define the capability of the aircraft uh, to move in the horizontal and uh, vertical directions. And so, at, uh, and what is the altitude that it will be able to achieve? And uh, so, what is the maximum speed it will be able to achieve? So, these parameters are defined uh, and dictated by the engine. So, next comes the electric power. So, when we talk about uh, the modern aircraft, and uh, so most of uh, them are driven by the electrical and electronic systems, which require the, uh, the electric power for their basic operation. Uh, so uh, this electric power is uh, generally derived from um, the engine's rotation. So there are uh, many high power generators which are coupled to the, the engine, which provides a mechanical motion for generating the necessary electrical power. So once it is generated, then we have 
uh, a distribution system so which uh, distributes the generated electric power to uh, different uh, uh, onboard electrical and electronic systems next comes the landing gear so irrespective of uh, how high you fly and how you fast you fly so after taking off so the aircraft is supposed to land back safely so the landing gear systems are uh, the essential uh, components which enable the safe safe landing of uh, the aircraft and next comes the environment control system so we all know that uh, so as we go higher so the atmospheric uh, parameters changes the pressure temperature and uh, so the density and the availability of oxygen everything changes so the environment control system is responsible for uh, maintaining an ambient uh, weather and uh, the climatic conditions within the aircraft so it is irrespective of whether it is a military aircraft or a civil aircraft as long as there is a human being um, uh, inside the aircraft so there is a need for having an environment control and it is not just for the human beings alone so even for the operation of uh, the electronic systems so we need to maintain a certain level of uh, uh, temperature and pressure conditions within the aircraft so the environment control system is responsible for providing the opt uh, uh, climatic conditions within the aircraft uh, which is an essential part of the aircraft design and the the last one is the avionics and which is uh, uh, the main topic of uh, today's discussion and uh, so whatever technologies we discuss so far like structure propulsion electric power landing gear and environment control so all these things are uh, the basic prerequisites means any aircraft is supposed to have uh, all these things so for a, a smoother and efficient operation of the aircraft but when it comes to avionics so i would call uh, these as uh, specialized systems which vary uh, drastically uh, from uh, Uh, one aircraft to another aircraft depending on the mission that it performs uh, for example if you had seen the cockpit of uh, a military aircraft and a civil aircraft you would have noticed the difference so in terms of uh, how many displays are present and what kind of uh, information that is being presented over there this is just an example i'm taking from the display standpoint because it is uh, visually uh, understandable quick to understand so uh, so we will uh, get to know more about this in the subsequent slides so when we uh, start with the topic of the avionics yes so as aerospace uh, uh, engineering students and also the as a practicing in engineers in aerospace industries many of you might have come across the terminology avionics and uh, so you must be aware of what does it mean and uh, uh, some of you may be already working on uh, those systems so but for the benefit of everyone so the avionics basically stands for the aviation electronics uh so actually it is all the electronic systems that are uh, used on board an aircraft for performing various missions uh, comprise the avionics and so here we have a formal definition which has been taken from the uh, the mil standard 1553a handbook and which is a us dod document which defines avionics as all electronic and electromechanical systems and subsystems installed in an aircraft or attached to it and uh, so the picture that you have here so uh, this is something that uh, uh, i used during my uh, university days for un uh, for understanding what is an avionics all about so our professor used to use the exactly the same figure Uh, to teach us so uh, the about the introduction of avionics 
And uh, so since those days, uh, I have not come across any better figure uh, which um, gives a con which introduces a concept of avionics in a more simpler manner. So, so if you see here, uh, so we already spoke about the displays, right? So the cockpit displays, which provides the interface to the pilot uh, for interacting with various mm -hmm. other uh, uh, avionics and control systems on board aircraft. And we have the communication uh, equipment, so which are basically the radio equipment used for communicating with the external world. And apart from that, so the pilot also has the provisions for uh, uh, providing his uh, input in terms of uh, data entry, uh, which will be used by uh, different avionic system for their operation. For example, uh, for the communication radio uh, to be tuned to a particular channel or a frequency, uh, the pilot will be able to select the channel through this data entry devices. And so, we also have the, the flight control system, so which is uh, uh, responsible for the controlling the uh, movement of the aircraft in uh, uh, six degree of freedom. So when we say six degree of freedom, it is uh, three linear motions, the forward uh, and the vertical and the sideways motion, and also the, the three rotations, which we talk about. Uh, with respect to the three axes, the pitch, roll, and uh, heading. So these uh, parameters of the aircraft are controlled primarily by the flight control system. And uh, so this is also responsible for the maintaining the stability of the aircraft. So it uh, prevents or protects the aircraft from uh, losing the control and uh, crashing. And then we have the aircraft state sensors. Basically, they provide the current state of the aircraft. So when we go in the car, so the primary parameters that we are interested in are, so what is the direction in which we are going and what is the speed at which we are going and what is the fuel level. So similarly, when we fly in the aircraft, so we, uh, we have to get to know some of the primary parameters like, so what is the speed? So when we say speed, it uh, involves both uh, horizontal as well as vertical speed. And uh, so again, in terms of uh, uh, the location, so we should know where we are. And uh, right now we are using Google Maps and other means to uh, precisely know uh, where exactly we are irrespective of where uh, in which vehicle we are in. So similarly, the aircrafts should know and it is uh, more essential for the aircraft to know its uh, uh, exact location because uh, when you are flying the air, so you don't have any visual cues for uh, uh, recognizing uh, your location, unlike uh, uh, on the ground. So it is very essential for uh, having a navigation system, so which uh, helps the aircraft to uh, understand so its uh, current position in terms of latitude, longitude, and as well as altitude. And so again, when we talk about uh, the location, there are various means uh, to uh, know the location of the aircraft or to calculate the location of the aircraft. So traditionally, there were many radio navigation systems uh, like uh, uh, the LoRaN system and the direction finders and the VHF Omni range, which we call as VOR, and also the Doppler radars, which are primarily used for uh, identifying the, uh, the location of the aircraft with respect to various uh, uh, external re ground references. And apart from that, so the, the pilot is also supposed to know, uh, depending on his mission, uh, about the external world. For example, for a fighter aircraft, it is important to know where his targets are. Uh, the targets could be either, either an aerial targets or could be ground targets. So, so he needs to uh, know the location of the target so that he'll be able to uh, perform his attacks and uh, other missions uh, precisely. So the sensors like radar and infrared sensors um, help in performing these missions. And so, so these are some of the core systems that uh, uh, any aircraft will have depending on its mission. So this is just a glimpse of 
uh, what the avionics is all about and uh, for each mission so uh, the uh, we will have to include multiple other sensors and systems which would facilitate uh, the pilot to perform his job so why do we need avionics so we have discussed uh, the definition of avionics and what the avionics consists of so why should we have all these things so as we discussed it is uh, required for uh, helping the flight crew and in fact even the aircraft to carry out uh, its mission safely and efficiently right so if you uh, see the example of the Wright brothers first aircraft uh, the only few instruments that they used were uh, uh, the instrument to measure the speed and uh, they used a magnetic compass basically to provide the direction and uh, i think there was also a um, instrument for uh, measuring the engine rpm so that's all they had so they didn't even have a instrument for measuring the altitude because uh, their flight was of uh, was at a very low altitude and uh, they were able to see everything visually so but once the aircraft flight envelope started increasing so there was a need to uh, understand more about the aircraft's current state so once the visual cues uh, disappeared so there was a need to understand what what was uh, uh, beyond the aircraft's uh, or the pilot's visibility so so this added up so a lot of other sensors and uh, so basically all these things were uh, used for uh, improving the aircraft's performance and control right and uh, so if you take the civil aircraft so it doesn't have to perform uh, uh, difficult maneuvers means it need not turn drastically or it need not uh, 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 climb or dive uh, at uh, steep angles but which are the requirements for a military aircraft so depending up on the capability of the aircraft uh, so it is important uh, to uh, have the, the uh, control system designed for achieving those uh, uh, aerodynamic performances. So the avionics helped in a uh, big way uh, to control the aircraft efficiently. So that is what we discussed here in this diagram as a flight control system. And uh, the next is, thing is the reduction in fuel consumption. So if you uh, talk about the aviation and airlines business, uh, so the, the main factor there is uh, how to optimize the cost. Okay, so one of the major cost factors for uh, any aircraft is uh, fuel consumption, right? So, uh, so we need a system so which can uh, optimize the fuel consumption uh, uh, within the flight envelope for performing a given mission. And uh, another important thing is the pilot's workload, right? So the, the, the pilot in the cockpit has to perform um, multiple tasks. So we'll get into the details when we discuss about the architecture. And so it is important to design the systems which can uh, reduce the pilot's workload so that he can concentrate on the main mission objectives rather than uh, operating multiple systems and controls and all weather operation okay so uh, during initial days there were a lot of restrictions for the uh, aircraft to operate uh, in uh, unfavorable weather conditions uh, for example whenever there was a thunderstorm or cyclone or um, uh, turbulent weather conditions so there were uh, restrictions uh, in the operation of the aircrafts that was primarily because the aircrafts are not equipped with the necessary uh, sensors and systems uh, which can uh, detect and uh, change the course of the aircraft uh, to ensure a safe flight. But with the modern uh, avionics, this, this has been made possible. So we can say that means uh, we see hardly um, uh, any cancellation due to uh, a normal rain or a thunderstorm scenario. So only under very severe uh, cyclonic or uh, storm conditions, so the flights uh, are getting cancelled. So this is primarily enabled by the avionics, right? Then another important factor is the safety of the aircraft. Means when we talk about the mission of the um, 
uh, a civil passenger aircraft it has to safely transport the people from one place to another place with the necessary comfort level and also the environmental conditions right so uh, when we try to automate many of the operations on board the aircraft which were uh, earlier performed by the pilot so we need to ensure that so the the systems that replace the pilot's role are uh, reliable enough means they are less prone to failure so that uh, they can uh, provide the ensure the safe operation of the flight and the air traffic control requirements so when multiple aircrafts fly, uh, share the same airspace so there is a need for controlling their movement in order to avoid the accidents and collisions so there is a lot of uh, ground infrastructure like the air traffic control established uh, in and around air airports and also in various other places which uh, uh, ensures this so the aircraft should be equipped to interact with uh, this uh, ground infrastructure uh, in order to maintain the safe distance from other aircrafts uh, thus ensuring the the safe uh, sharing of the airspace uh, next comes the operational and maintenance costs so we discussed that uh, so the one of the primary objectives of the airlines is to optimize the cost uh, so the avionics uh, that is being designed for an aircraft should be easily maintainable and uh, so it should have a higher reliability so that uh, so the aircraft are uh, available for uh, um, most part of its uh, life uh, for the operation yeah so next comes okay so we discussed uh, uh, what is the role that is being played by avionics uh, but when it comes to the uh, the cost of the overall aircraft so what is the contribution of an uh, avionics so here are some statistics and uh, so you can also see the trend uh, of uh, the increasing contribution of avionics uh, towards the cost of the aircraft design so if you uh, if you see in the during the initial periods uh, around 1950 to 60 uh, the avionics contribution was hardly 10%, but with the modern aircrafts, uh, it has uh, already crossed 40%. So at least if you take the example of a military fighter aircraft, uh, the like uh, JSF, so it is already 40 to 50% of the total cost of the aircraft. And uh, even on a normal civil aircraft, uh, the avionics contributes around 30 to 40% of the total cost. And uh, to take an ex extreme uh, scenario, so we have uh, something called the airborne uh, early warning and control system, so which performs the surveillance uh, for the military forces, and it covers a very large area. So for this system, so the avionics contributes almost 75% of the total cost. So that is primarily because of the sophisticated uh, the surveillance sensor that are being used for uh, performing a wide area surveillance. So, so this is uh, about the contribution of uh, avionics uh, towards the aircraft cost. Yes, so now we understood uh, what is uh, avionics is all about and what role it plays uh, uh, in the mission of the aircraft and also in the design of the aircraft. So now let's come uh, to so the how the avionics systems are being designed means what is the basis for uh, defining the specifications and the architecture for avionics so this diagram basically shows a general uh, process uh, that is being followed for designing any aircraft systems not necessarily only avionics uh, so we discussed about uh, the mission of an aircraft so which is a primary so source from where uh, everything else is defined uh, for the aircraft. So the same concept is explained over here uh, in the form of uh, process flow. You can see here, so it all starts with the concept, so which is nothing but the mission of the aircraft. And uh, so from the mission, aircraft mission, uh, um, we derive 
what are the functions that are that need to be performed by aircraft in order to achieve those missions and uh, so then from the functions so we derive the requirements what are the functional requirements then the functional requirements get translated into the uh, the architecture so in order to uh, perform these functions so what are the uh, equipment and subsystems do we need so we discussed about so many uh, sensors and subsystems like uh, flight control system and uh, the air data sensors radars so uh, depending on the mission so we identify uh, what are the systems and sensors that we need in order to achieve the uh, the the mission objectives then based on the uh, aircraft architecture so we de develop the requirements for each of those systems so we have identified what are the subsystems required and so now we have to decompose and further detail out what each system needs to perform and what is what are the performance requirements for each of those systems then again the next phase is uh, uh, talking about uh, the development of the architecture for each of those systems so earlier we defined the architecture for the whole aircraft and whereas here so we are defining the architecture for the individual uh, subsystems and uh, sensors that we discussed then comes the implementation phase where actual uh, the physical uh, transformation of the requirements and architecture takes place and we get the physical system which uh, ultimately goes on to the aircraft so 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 based on the previous process flow so we can now uh, define a uh, process which is more focused on the avionic system architectures so from the aircraft mission definition uh, so we do perform a mission analysis so wherein uh, we identify what are the mission functions the aircraft is supposed to perform just to give an example let's take a, a case of uh, the multi role uh, fighter aircraft so which is a modern aircraft with uh, more uh, multiple capabilities it is uh, capable of performing multiple missions so the multi role uh, combat aircraft is uh, expected to perform the air to ground uh, attack missions and it should be capable of handling the air to air targets means the other aircrafts and other aerial targets and it should be capable of performing uh reconnaissance missions whenever required and uh, uh, it should be capable of uh, detecting the weather right and uh, it should it should be also ca be capable of uh, performing an air to air refueling so there are multiple uh, uh functions or the mission functions which are expected out of uh, multi role combat aircraft so the first phase we define that yes so i need to develop a multi role com uh, combat aircraft and uh, through the mission analysis so we identify what are the missions that are uh, required to be performed by this aircraft and next comes the capability definition for the aircraft so in order to perform the each of those missions that were identified what capabilities uh, should the aircraft have for example uh, in order to uh, perform an air to ground bombing so the aircraft should be equipped with uh the sensors which are capable of uh, uh, acquiring and tracking the ground uh, targets so it could be a, a radar system or it could be an electro optic uh, sensor like a camera or it could be a laser based sensor so there are multiple options available so but ultimately we have to define uh, so what kind of uh, uh sensors or the what kind of targets uh, the aircraft is supposed to acquire and uh, um attack and next comes uh, so what kind of weapons it should it should be capable of handling because uh, uh, there are multiple uh, uh, types of uh, air to ground weapons available uh, under different weight categories uh, whether the aircraft should be uh, capable of handling the heavy weight uh, bombs or uh, it is primarily meant for handling the smart bombs which are of low ca uh, weight category but at the same time so they are more lethal so all those uh, um, specifications have to be defined as part of this phase the aircraft capability definition the next next comes the functional and performance requirement okay so having 
define the capability. So what are the functions it needs to perform? Uh, so let's take uh, the uh, case of the air-to-air -air attack. So here, so the aircraft is supposed to acquire the targets uh, beyond the visual range. Basically, so when the enemy aircraft is uh, not, e even when the enemy aircraft is not visible to the pilot, so the aircraft should be uh, equipped with the sensors through which uh, the pilot will be able to acquire or uh, detect the presence of the enemy aircraft. So once the acquisition is done and the tracking has to be performed, means it has to continuously keep monitoring where the target is moving. And uh, so at the right time, the, the pilot provides the uh, command to release the, uh, the appropriate weapon. Uh, most in most of the cases, it is the uh, the air-to-air -air missiles. Okay, so once the once the pilot is sure that so the sensor is able to acquire the exact location of uh, the target, so he provides a command to place. So, so these are the functions, the sequence of operation which are performed by the pilot. So when he performs all these things, what each the system that has been um, um, included as part of the avionics is supposed to do. So now we could see that, yes, the, the radar is responsible for acquiring the target. And once it is acquired, it should be given to the display in the cockpit through which the pilot is able to see that the cockpit display is responsible for uh, depicting the, the target's position accurately. And uh, so once the pilot decides, then he, he gives like a weapon release command uh, through the control available in the cockpit. So the weapon system, which is responsible for launching the missile, should uh, appropriately take this command, understand it, and uh, it has to follow the sequence of um, the weapon launch. So that way, if you see, it means that the functions uh, are allocated to uh, various uh, systems on board uh, according to the mission. So this is what is captured as part of this aircraft functional and performance requirements. Next comes the avionics functional and performance requirements. Means, in fact, whatever we discussed so far was in the context of avionics. So uh, all that is applicable for this phase as well. So in fact, in the previous phase, uh, uh, it will be a, a little broader uh, level of definition. At the, at the aircraft level, it not only defines uh, the avionics functions, but also the other uh, non-avionic systems uh, fun functional requirements. But the basis for defining the, the avionics functions is the, the aircraft function and performance requirement. And so finally, so having defined so what the avionics is supposed to do, so now we enter into the definition of the avionics system architecture. So when we talk about the architecture, a system architecture, mm -hmm. basically uh, we define, so what are the elements so that uh, comprise the system and uh, so how they are interconnected with each other and uh, so how they are supposed to interact, means what data they are supposed to exchange with each other and uh, as a result, so what function do they perform? So this is uh, the basis of uh, the uh, system architecture. So even in the context of avionics, the definition remains the same. Okay, so now, so what uh, drives uh, the design of an avionic architecture? Means what are the factors? Means uh, we already discussed, so how uh, we arrived at the avionic system architecture, or at least the process which is followed till we reach the stage of architecture definition. So during that discussion, we discussed multiple factors which have been compiled and uh, put over here as the drivers uh, for uh, the avionics architecture design. So the first one is, the air, of course, the aircraft mission and capability definition. So this is a primary source which dictates the architecture. Next comes the avionics supply ecosystem. Okay, we will understand this aspect. So as we discuss uh, uh, more in detail about uh, the various uh, architectures, but just to give a first level idea here, what does the market have to offer? Means what are the systems and uh, sensors and technologies currently available in the market, which can be used for this? Means you can't uh, uh, um, develop an aircraft with, uh, um, imaginary system, which is not physically existing. 
either you have to develop or you have to use what is available right so the supply ecosystem uh, is one of the drivers and next of course is uh, the consideration uh, that we use for any project not necessarily only for the aircraft the budget and uh, schedule and so how quickly we need this aircraft to be operational and so what is the money that i have so even that defines or dictates so how my architecture should be or what component should be used next comes the reuse strategy so again this reuse strategy is linked to the the budget and schedule uh, when we say reuse using something which is already existing means we discussed so when we define uh, a system capability that system can be either developed if it is not already existing and if that system is already available we can reuse it so if there is a major constraint in terms of uh, uh, budget and schedule then uh, generally the aircraft designers go for this reuse strategy so just using what is available in the market in order to optimize the budget and schedule and the other one is the long term product strategy of the aircraft manufacturer means so here we discussed uh, if there is a constraint in terms of budget and schedule uh, definitely they go for the reuse strategy but in many cases what happens is uh, the businesses have the long term strategy so they don't just look for uh, short term benefits so uh, considering the future capabilities uh, that an aircraft needs to have in order to beat the competition and also uh, to optimize the development and operational cost so the aircraft manufacturers generally come up with a strategy to go for a completely new development or a, a totally a revolutionary concepts so whatever uh, the architectural concept that we are going to discuss in this session actually they are all result of this phase the the vision the either the aircraft manufacturer or uh, the uh, defense departments of different countries had towards the future of their either for their forces and fleet in terms of capabilities uh, for achieving different missions or in order to um, gain the monopoly or the dominance in the aviation market yes so now we are getting into the, our main topic that is a uh, uh, evolution of avionic architecture okay so if we look at the history of uh, the avionic architecture so it can be divided into four different phases uh, or four four different generation of uh, architectures starting uh, first second third and fourth so we'll be discussing uh, briefly about uh, each of these uh, architectures what are the salient features and uh, so what were the uh, factors uh, that drove the definition of these uh, concepts and having said that so these architectures are actually the architectural concepts means uh, basically uh, they don't define uh, the exact architecture which is being used in a given aircraft means it doesn't dictate okay this uh, in this is the architecture and these are the uh, sensors and subsystems that you are supposed to use and uh, and uh, this is the way that they are supposed to uh, share the data and exchange the information so it doesn't dictate that way but at the same time so they just define a high level framework within which uh so the different uh, aircraft designers uh, have the flexibility to uh, customize uh, their combination of systems and uh, so how they uh, perform their operation uh, in a coordinated way and so i will be uh, giving uh, more examples from the uh, military aircrafts uh, due to the reason that we discussed before as we discussed that uh, so most of the Uh, developments in avionics happened uh, uh, during the initial stages in the uh, defense domain and they were defined by uh, primarily the us Def department of defense and uh, and uh, so the defense uh, establishments of a few other countries 
and even the standards for uh, these architectures and the data buses were primarily driven by uh, those establishments. And uh, so even if you see my background, so I have spent most of my career uh, in the military avionics domain. So for me, uh, it comes spontaneously to quote the example from uh, uh, the military domain. So that way, so we will be uh, discussing more about military aircrafts uh, during the uh, uh, first two generation of architectures. And uh, so thereafter, so I will also give uh, some uh, examples from the civil domain because um, uh, ultimately uh, the flow down has happened from the military domain to the civil domain, so which has adopted those concepts. And uh, so they are used for the larger benefit of the entire civil aviation community. So definitely we will not exclude the, uh, the civil aircrafts and the civil aviation part. So in this, we will definitely come to that. So uh, first generation architecture, so they were primarily defined during the initial stages of uh, the aviation between 1940s and 50s. And if you can see that uh, it also overlaps uh, with the period of the Second World War, which was between 1939 to 45. Um, so there are two architectures come under this uh, generation, the disjoint or independent architecture and the centralized architecture. Second generation, again, it comes in the next decade between 60s and 70s. And uh, so this era actually um, was uh, more revolutionary uh, with the advent of uh, uh, digital computer and uh, also with the advancement of uh, uh, communication and uh, the data bus uh, uh, technologies. So under this, so primarily we have a federated architecture. And so the other two architectures are actually the derivatives of the federated architecture. And the third generation, uh, these are again more advanced so even though we see the period of these architectures as 80s and 90s, uh, I would say that uh, we are still not uh, completely realized what was envisaged uh, through this uh, architectural concepts. So when we get into the details, we'll be more clear, okay, uh, what is the current status of uh, in terms of implementation? And the last one is uh, the futuristic, I would say the futuristic, so even though it is, it has been implemented in one of the aircrafts now, and so there is more scope for uh, uh, extending this to uh, many more aircrafts, both in military as well as uh, civil domain. Okay, so let's get started with the first generation architecture and the first candidate is the disjoint architecture. Uh, so we discussed about a specific act, uh, aspect called uh, pilot's workload. So when we are discussing about what is the need for an avionics. So one of the primary objectives of uh, the avionics is to reduce the pilot's workload, right? So, uh, but during the initial days, so when they were, uh, the, uh, the tasks performed by an aircraft were very limited. Uh, so there was no need for uh, having uh, multiple systems and uh, multiple displays on board. And but so the pilot is a person that who is supposed to control all the things that is on the aircraft. So, for example, uh, uh, he has to fly the aircraft basically. So, in addition to that, he should know uh, where he is currently, the situational awareness. So, in terms of position, where he is located, and uh, so what he is surrounded with. Um, then. If it is a military aircraft, so he has an additional responsibility of uh, performing a strike or an attack. It right? means he has to uh, drop the bombs or the launch the missiles. But again, during the initial days, the um, uh, the weapons were very primitive. So for the air to ground, they were using bombs, and uh, so for the air to air, the primary weapon was the air to air gun. So. Uh, relatively, their operations were simpler. And again, uh, considering the capability at that point of time, uh, so the precision of uh, those uh, attacks were uh, uh, really, precision of those attacks were really bad. 
so uh, so the pilot had to uh, perform all these operations as a single person so if you see here as per this architecture uh, so the pilot uh, plays the role of uh, uh, the system integrator so he uses all these uh, uh, sensors controls available and uh, he performs all these basic functions like flight control and uh, so he has to communicate with uh, others either with the ground station or with the other uh, pilots through the radio sets so he has to manually operate the, operate those radio sets in terms of tuning the frequency and channel and the navigation again so they didn't have sophisticated navigation systems like gps so uh, they used to use um, uh, only the the speed and uh, the altitude information and and the direction information based on which time to time they are supposed to uh, plot their location on a, a paper map and in addition to that of course they had a few radio navigational aids uh, they were uh, relatively automated and they were able to uh, provide the relative uh, position of the aircraft so but still the uh, pilot had to operate all these systems manually and uh, he is supposed to integrate the information provided by all these things and he has to decide the actions to be performed and he has to give the command and control the entire aircraft and he is also responsible for uh, uh, weapon delivery calculations means again so there are no um, uh, powerful computers which can automatically predict uh, the uh, target's position and uh, the weapon's uh, impact point and all that stuff so this was again uh, done using the lookup tables right so based on the data provided on uh, this displays okay so the pilot uh, was uh, tremendously loaded so even though the task were uh, much simpler compared to the uh, current era so still the pilot's uh, workload was uh, tremendously high and but still uh, it was easier for the pilot to perform with all these systems rather than uh, not having these systems yeah so this is uh, the an example for a disjoint architecture is a mig 21 aircraft which was defined in uh, uh, which was designed in 1960s so you can see the cockpit of the aircraft and uh, as you can see the n number of uh, electromechanical displays and dials so you won't see any of the digital displays except for uh, the display for the radar and uh, so there is a, a optical site for uh, aiming and targeting so all other things so you can just imagine the amount of uh, the workload that the pilot uh, uh, takes up just to uh, read all these instrument and understand what do they mean and interpret process and uh, calculate take the decision and finally carry out the successful uh, mission of either uh, attacking a ground target or an aerial target it is phenomenal so so the disjoint architecture even though it uh, helped the pilot uh, to some some way but again still the pilot's workload was uh, very high with this architecture so next comes the centralized architecture so which uh, uh, used the advancements in the digital computer technology so the um, f111 aircraft was the first uh, aircraft to uh, exploit this advancement so basically it had a, a, a central processing computer which was called cpc and two such computers were there basically for redundancy and uh, so the the information provided by all the sensors on board so they were all routed uh, to this single central processing computer but again this was not a, a very powerful computer and you can imagine what would have been the processing power in 1960s and 70s so with that limited processing power so whatever uh, could be derived out of this so that was performed by this computers and provided to the pilot but again so here the restriction was in terms of software I means since the processing power was very limited and uh, the number of functions to be performed are very high so the algorithms need to be highly optimized and so even the precision uh, uh, of the output of those algorithms had to be compromised but still 
uh, this gave, uh, gave a leverage uh, or uh, a mileage over the uh, the previous uh, architecture, the disjoint architecture, in terms of having uh, more computation power and reducing the pilot's wor workload to a large extent. But here, if you see here, so whatever the uh, connectivity I have shown uh, from uh, the various uh, sensors and systems to the computer, they are all of different interfaces. Some of them are analog and some of them are um, uh, the differential signals, some of them are uh, open and ground, some of them are discrete. There are multiple types of uh, uh, interfaces that were used. So there was a signal or data converter which was responsible for uh, converting or uh, taking all these uh, multiple types of signals and uh, uh, data and uh, converting into a common digital format and uh, providing to the uh, the CPC. So that way it is. Uh, so the in terms of interfaces, so we need we need to have very uh, long wires to connect uh, uh, the different uh, sensor to the CPC, which is in a fixed location. So these are some of the uh, drawbacks of this centralized architecture. And you can see here, this is a F111D cockpit. And uh, you can compare this with the earlier MiG-21 cockpit. So at least we can see some digital displays, right? And uh, so wherein uh, the output of the, uh, the central processing computer was uh, uh, displayed, right? So that way, uh, so that the pilot uh, could avoid reading uh, multiple uh, uh, dials to get the information. So everything was provided in an uh, integrated display. But again, so it is only the limited information. There are, you can see that there's still, there are so many other dials which uh, he needed to uh, read and interpret. So these are some of the features, advantages and disadvantages. Uh, so first thing is it is a simple design because there is a single computer. Okay, you can easily change the software. There is a one computer, one software, and easy for uh, maintenance. And uh, so the computers are located uh, in a fixed location, so you can easily access them. And uh, so the, basically the maintenance is easier. So coming to the drawbacks, we already discussed some of the drawbacks. Okay, so the long data buses and the flexibility in software is very low because there is one only one software. So even for uh, small changes, uh, you have to uh, change the same software and you have to get it recertified. So there was uh, flexibility wise, uh, it was uh, poorer compared to the other modern architectures. And single point failure, because there's only one computer, if the one if that computer fails, and even though we had a redundancy in terms of CPC1 and CPC2, still uh, uh, there is a potential single point failure scenario, which is possible. And another thing is the multiple types of interfaces, what we discussed already. Okay, so the last point, so the multiple uh, types of interfaces which were uh, required and uh, uh, which are um, which which was difficult to maintain uh, gave a motivation to develop a common standard interface instead of having multiple types of uh, interfaces. So uh, the community decided to come up with a common uh, communication interface standard, uh, which could be used for connecting so all the sensors and systems that we discussed. So this uh, gave uh, birth to the next generation, the second generation architecture, uh, which we call as federated architecture. So uh, the meaning of the term federated is very important. So we talk about the federal systems in politics. So wherein we have uh, uh, multiple independent states with uh, their own um, autonomy and uh, the power to uh, manage on their own. but. Uh, still, uh, they join together and form a central authority, okay, and uh, they function as a, a single uh, administrative and political system. So the same concept is used over here. Here, if you see uh, whatever functions uh, we um, uh, discussed earlier, uh, which were uh, performed by multiple sensors and systems, so they have been integrated uh, uh, into um, integrated functions. For example, in this picture, you can see here the navigation computation and uh, the mission computation, which involves the attack functions and also the function for driving the display. So all these things have been combined uh, into uh, 
couple of uh, processing units here. So, and similarly, you can see the flight controls and uh, flight management and the inertial navigation system. So they have been uh, um, incorporated as part of uh, uh, different processing units. Basically, whatever was performed by a single unit in the centralized architecture by the central processing computer have been decomposed. And uh, so they are being performed by multiple processing units here. So since the processing power of the computer is limited, and uh, so it was a prudent uh, decision to divide the functions uh, and uh, process them using multiple computers rather than a single computer. So, so this was uh, the, the primary idea of uh, federated architecture. And uh, so again, so all this uh, uh, independent processing units, so they are all um, interconnected by a common standard interface. We discussed that. Uh, so the primary motivation for federated architecture is this common standard interface. It means instead of having multiple types of interfaces, um, so this uh, gives uh, uh, freedom and flexibility uh, to um, maintain the, the overall avionics uh, in an uh, efficient manner. So if you see here, so uh, the architectural concept that are discussed over here, so they are primarily focusing on two aspects. The first one is the, the data processing or the computing part. The other one is the interconnectivity between the functions or the functional systems. So uh, how these uh, processing elements are distributed or uh, co-located, centralized. So there are different combinations that are being tried out. So this is underlying principle of coming up with uh, different architectures. It means when you go through the other architectures that are in the uh, subsequent slides, we'll get to know. So the, the focus is more on, so how do we uh, utilize and arrange the processing elements and uh, interconnect them in an efficient way for uh, achieving our uh, objectives, either mission objectives and the operational objectives. So if you see in the federated architecture, these are some of the key features. So there are several data processes are used to perform, which we already discussed. And so this gives the flexibility for uh, uh, different suppliers to come up with uh, uh, independent uh, avionic systems, which uh, perform a specific function. And so, and again, they have the freedom to use whichever data processor they want, means it is not necessary to have a same kind of processor. And to one way, if you see, means it also uh, is advantageous, uh, given the fact that, so when we have different uh, um, processing elements of different types, so uh, we can avoid the common mode failures. Means even if one function fails or the one of the process fails, the other processor uh, can still work because it is of different type. So that's one of the advantages. And the next feature is the uh, standard digital interface, which we already discussed, right? And uh, resource sharing occurs at the last link in the information chain. So if you see here, so all the uh, systems uh, function independently. And uh, so the, the displays in the cockpit collect all that information and provide to the pilot in an integrated manner. So, so that so the pilot can uh, understand uh, the outcome of uh, the processing that has been done in multiple uh, functional elements in one place without having to read in multiple places. In addition to that, it has also added intelligence, means whatever is produced on the display is not a raw information. So it is a processed information, uh, so uh, which includes a lot of uh, algorithms and calculations, which uh, the pilot used to perform manually in the, uh, the previous generation of architectures. So we discussed in the disjoint architecture, so how uh, he had to combine the uh, information from the various sensors in order to perform the navigation and the weapon delivery calculations manually, right? So the, all those manually manual calculations have been converted into automated algorithms here. And the result of those algorithms are provided, uh, provided in a graphical manner uh, on the displays. So that way, so the pilot's workload is uh, considerably reduced uh, with this architecture. 
and the programmability and versatility of the data process, which we already discussed, right? Yes, and, and so the topic of this session is actually the avionics architectures uh, and data buses. But uh, so the architecture itself is a, a very vast uh, um, subject. Means you can see that means we planned for uh, one hour of this session, but uh, so we are still in the 60 to 70 percent of completion because the, the information uh, or the concepts that are associated with uh, all these uh, architectures require actually uh, at least uh, two or three days uh, session. I Means it has been compressed into uh, one, one and a half hour session uh, for this webinar. So, um, so what I thought was uh, instead of uh, having a separate uh, a section for the data buses, uh, I thought of just giving uh, uh, an integrated concept of architecture and the data buses means how the data buses evolved along with the architectures and what is the role of those different data buses and how they are related to these avionic architectures. And if means because uh, if you want to understand about those uh, data bus protocols, there are a lot of materials available in open source. Means you, there are a lot of tutorials available for many standard protocols, so which you can uh, obviously go through offline. And uh, so, so that is the way that uh, this uh, presentation has been uh, uh, designed here. But, uh, uh, but at the end of this uh, discussion on the architecture, I will just provide a summary of uh, the, all the data buses. I think uh, that might be sufficient. Then after that, you can uh, go through about the data buses uh, uh, through those uh, uh, online tutorials available through various sources. So in the context of federated architectures, one of the development that happened uh, in the context of data bus is the, uh, the introduction of the MIL standard 1553B uh, interface. So this was uh, um, the first uh, digital data bus, which was uh, used uh, for the digital avionics. And uh, again, of course, it was introduced for uh, military aircraft for F-16 of uh, US military. And uh, so, and uh, this was introduced in 1970s, if I'm not wrong. Um, so, but even though it is 50 years old, uh, you won't believe that this data bus is still ruling the world of uh, uh, avionics, especially the military avionics. Even in the most modern, uh, the military aircraft, so they could not avoid the usage of uh, this particular protocol. So that shows the importance of this. And so as we discussed, uh, there was a common uh, standard interface uh, which was uh, required for connecting all those things. And this MIL standard 1553B uh, filled that gap. So you can see here, so this is a general architecture of the 1553B based uh, uh, avionics communication network. So it is again based on a master con uh, slave philosophy. It means uh, you can uh, see the influence of military even on the data bus definition. Means in the military, you can say that is whatever master says uh, is your Bible, right? So, so here, so we have something called a bus controller, which controls and manages uh, all the other uh, systems on this network. So we have something called remote terminals, which obey the command of uh, the bus controller. So I don't want to get into too many details. Okay, so this is just to give an uh, introduction of uh, this uh, uh, MIL standard 15 with the DB considering its importance in the history of uh, avionics. Okay, I think so, we'll not go uh, much more into this because we already discussed many other things, but uh, at least uh, the disadvantages, I think we have to discuss because that is what gives rise to the, uh, the next architecture. You can see the, there are a lot of resources, means we discussed that uh, the the uh, avionics functionality has been di uh, divided into multiple sub functionalities and uh, it gave rise to multiple uh, processing systems so in avionics terminology we call them as lrus that is a line replaceable unit so the the reason behind the name is uh, for whenever you want to perform the maintenance of that system you should be able to uh, readily remove it from the aircraft and it should be easily accessible. So that gave rise to the name called the uh, line re replaceable unit, LRUs. 
So you can see that there are multiple uh, LRUs which uh, uses uh, um, uh, different types of processes and again the associated softwares and the interfaces and every um, LRU had its own um, um, the packaging, right? And the chassis and the power supply. So all those things, even though uh, all the systems were using the similar types of uh, elements within them still due to the functional decomposition so we uh, we had to develop uh, multiple such boxes okay which considerably increased the weight of the aircraft and also it made means uh, up to certain level uh, it gave advantage of uh, having a clear separation of uh, functionalities but so when the capabilities and the features required by the aircraft uh, continuously increased, uh, so uh, at certain point of time, it became unmanageable. Means even in the uh, case of, if you, uh, uh, for those who have studied the software uh, uh, requirements analysis or the software architecture or the system architecture uh, concepts, uh, so we start with the high level uh, system and uh, we decompose that into multiple subsystems or sub functions. But so there is a limit prescribed by uh, the, those concepts uh, where to stop means we can't keep on decomposing uh, uh, into multiple levels. So the prescribed level is either uh, three or four levels max, right? Three is the most ideal case. Uh, at the most, we can go to the fourth level. So, so in the case of federated, also the same thing happened. So, when the functionalities were continuously decomposed and uh, into multiple levels, so at certain point of time, the system became unmanageable. And uh, so, even in terms of maintenance, it was very difficult. There were n number of processes of different types, and ev every system needed its uh, uh, own uh, maintenance procedures to be followed. So it uh, really became unmanageable for both uh, the civil community as well as the military community, right? So these aspects, these disadvantages uh, gave rise to the, the next architecture. Sorry. Um, okay. So before going into the, the next generation, so we will discuss uh, some of the offshoots of this federated architecture. So uh, again, they are not totally different from the federated architecture. So the distributed architecture is basically uh, based on the concept of what we discussed just now. It means the continuous decomposition of the functionalities and introducing uh, uh, multiple processing elements and distributing uh, to a large extent. Okay, so the disadvantages remain the same. And so another offshoot of uh, the federated architecture is the hierarchical architecture. So wherein, uh, so in the previous example, we saw a common standard interface. So wherein we had a single network uh, where all the systems were uh, connected through the remote terminals and uh, it was controlled by the bus controller. But in some cases, what happened was uh, considering the, uh, the criticality and priority of uh, different functions, uh, uh, they came up with a concept called hierarchical architecture, wherein the functions of uh, higher criticality and uh, lower criticality were divided into uh, different networks, different networks. And ultimately, again, so they were integrated through a main network. So this way, uh, so they could isolate and avoid the propagation of failure uh, in the low uh, priority or the low criticality uh, functionality to the high criticality functionality. So, yes. So now uh, we are entering the third generation architecture. And uh, this was uh, christened as pave pillar architecture. And uh, its primary objective was to overcome all the drawbacks that we discussed uh, about the federated architecture. So the main drawback was uh, the multiple processors of different types, right? And uh, so they came up with a concept uh, wherein all those uh, processing uh, uh, elements or the, all those functions were integrated or implemented using a common set of data processors. Means, for example, 
if uh, the power pc is a processor used for one of the functions they decided to use the same processor for all other functions and another uh, change was instead of having um, uh, the functions implemented in multiple lrus or the multiple units they decided to bring everything together into a single unit so maybe i will go to the next uh, slide to explain this if if you see here so if you take any single lru so it has both hardware as well as software resources right irrespective of uh, the function that uh, it implements so these are the standard resources used by any avionics lru like power supply processor memory chassis shared io right so these things are independent of which function that you are going to implement in that but of course depending upon the uh, computational power required for different function uh, so the, the processor selection may be different but of course every system uses a processor similarly on the software front if you see operating system utility software and hardware byte that is a built in test so all these things are common things which are used for any software right so uh, if you take the multiple uh, lrus which were implemented as part of federated architecture you can see that uh, so there was a redundant redundancy or the wastage of resources means so every system was using all these common resources uh, so there was a multiplication of uh, these resources due to the number of uh, units that are present so which ultimately led to the weight of the aircraft so in the papillar architecture so what happened was uh, they decided to uh, bring all the processors to a single place okay so instead of having separate boxes they decided to implement them in the form of separate cards right separate um, uh, processing cards but again having the same functionality and having the common uh, hardware resources Uh, which will serve all those processing elements for example the power supply uh, the memory system uh, chassis and uh, ios so all these things were introduced as common elements so uh, with this concept uh, uh, we could get rid of uh, the repetitive usage of these resources and redundant usage of this yes so you can see here so this is the the papillar architecture you can see here uh, there are two uh, cips we call it as common integrated processors and uh, you might get reminded of the central computer that we discussed in the case of uh, the centralized architecture so after uh, going for federated concept so again so now the cycle has come back to the centralized con concept but the major difference over here is the cip is not a single processor it is a combination of multiple processors which are packed into a single chassis and again it is not just the processors over here so we have all the common resources that we spoke about so we have just one power supply which serves all the processors and again we have a common memory which is shared by all the processing elements and again so we have one single operating system uh, which is uh, controlling the functions uh, that are running on multiple processors so that way the common resources whatever we saw in the previous slide so they are all shared by the multiple functions and so they are packaged into a single unit called the common integrated processor here so this could this way it could save a lot of weight and uh, uh, also there was a standardization of the processing elements here means where uh, as much as possible the data processes used here are uh, of same type or maybe one or two types max not more than that and not only the data processing even the signal processing uh, processes were standardized over here so let me go to the the little more detail of uh, this uh, common integrated processor you can see here uh, so whatever is marked as d so they are all the data processors and uh, so we also have sp which is a signal processor and uh, so we have multiple data processors and few signal processors and uh, so which are all connected through the backplane 
data bus so for the data sharing and so again so they are connected with uh, the other cips through a high speed link called high speed data bus so which is uh, providing a speed of 50 megabits per second so this is uh, from the hardware standpoint right so again from the processing standpoint if you see here uh, yes you have all the processing elements in one layer and uh, so which use the common resources the common operating system right and uh, so and the application software run on the top level means we have the application software for multiple functions again uh, so each uh, each of this data process we saw in the hardware architecture uh, they primarily are responsible for uh, running uh, one of those functions but uh, whenever required, so they will be capable of running the other functions also. For example, if one of the data processor fails and the corresponding functionality fails, the next data processor is capable of taking over that functionality and executing it. So that way, so the resources are shared and uh, that way we are able to achieve the redundancy as well. So which improves the overall reliability of the availability of the avionics functions. So that is a uh, the primary advantage uh, or the leverage uh, given provided by this pay pillar architecture. So coming to the features, uh, just to summarize whatever we discussed now, uh, the higher level of avionics integration and resource sharing is yes, through common integrated processes and uh, the rapid flow of data. So we had the high speed data bus, which provides uh, 50 megabits per second and, and it is an optical interface. Right, so which facilitates the high bandwidth data transfer, and here coming to the the role of the pilot. So in all the previous architectures, so the pilot's workload was uh, really tremendous, right? And so even though uh, the information was uh, provided in an integrated manner, so still the pilot had to uh, perform a lot of uh, manual operations. So. Uh, those workloads were reduced considerably over here because uh, it also incorporated uh, uh, the artificial intelligence uh, like expert systems as part of the uh, the application software okay so which uh, provided the ready-made decision options for uh, the pilot so that way uh, uh, to a large extent uh, except for some critical functions like mis missile launch so most of the things uh, were simplified for the pilot. So instead of uh, playing the role of uh, uh, avionics system operator, means instead of controlling multiple things, so uh, the pilot's role transformed into the role of a weapon system manager. So you are just responsible for uh, taking the advisories and multiple options and just taking a decision. So that way there is a considerable reduction in the pilot's workload. Okay, and enhanced fault tolerance due to resource sharing. This also we discussed due to the redundancy available and the resource sharing. And so the system was highly tolerant to the faults. Even if one of the data processor or few data process fails, still uh, the other data processes or, or the signal processor are capable of taking up that role. Yes, so this PayPillar architecture was first implemented on the, uh, the F-22 Raptor aircraft in 1990s. And you can see these are the list of uh, functions which were integrated uh, into a single CAP. The core mission computations, the electronic warfare signal and data processing, and the communication navigation signal data processing, radar signal data processing, display and video processing, Okay, and uh, gateways and the interface management. So if you had seen in the federated architecture, so we would have had individual uh, LRUs for each of these functions, okay, which would have increased the weight and the, uh, the maintainability of, uh, uh, sorry, the, the weight of the aircraft tremendously, and also it, uh, it would have reduced the maintainability of uh, the systems. Okay, and coming to the RF processing system. Okay, so here we spoke mainly about the data and signal processing. So the RF is a radio frequency. So this processing is totally different and the hardware that is used for the RF processing is 
uh, totally different from uh, what we use for normal digital processing, right? So even at this level, so there was an integration. So they used the integrated um, uh, processes at the RF level as well. But again, it was uh, uh, confined to individual uh, uh, senses. For example, so whatever uh, uh, multiple processing units uh, were used for the radar-related processing, they were all integrated. And similarly, uh, CNI and uh, electronic warfare. Okay, so now so far we discussed uh, more about the, the military aircraft example. So now uh, we will get into some uh, civil uh, aircraft concepts, okay, and uh, how uh, the, the military architectural concepts were flowed down, flown down to the, the civil avionics. Okay, so one of the uh, popular architecture in the civil world in the recent times uh, is the integrated modular avionics, means it is a buzzword, I would say. But if you see here, um, this IMA is nothing but the uh, equivalent of uh, papular architecture, which was implemented on F-22. Means this has been adopted directly from F-22 for the, uh, the civil avionics. And uh, so till then, the civil aircrafts were also using uh, either the federated or distributed architectures, and they also suffered whatever drawbacks we discussed associated with the federated and distributed. Okay, and uh, so the IMA came as a boon for the aircraft developers. Okay, and uh, they quickly adapted to that. But again, there are still a lot of challenges which we'll be discussing at the end of uh, uh, this section, particularly. Okay, and so the concept remains same. So, okay, so it is an excellent modularity, portability, and multiple functions on single LRU. So all these things we discussed in the case of uh, uh, pay pillar. So again, this just draws the comparison between the federated and the IMA. You can see here, so we had uh, multiple uh, processing units using, uh, again, repeatedly the common resources. So wherein, in the case of IMA, all those uh, resources, common resources, for example, all the processors and the communication network and the interfaces, all these things have been combined. So only the uh, the functionality or the application part uh, has been implemented differently, sharing those common hardware resources. Yes, so this is again another depiction of uh, what we had. Okay, so here you can see what are the some of the primary functions which are generally implemented in individual LRUs have been combined into the IM, IMA. Okay, so here uh, primarily the civil related uh, civil aviation related functionalities have been listed compared to the earlier list which contained more of uh, military functions and in addition to that so there are still other aircraft means even though we talk about the IMA or the pay pillar so where we could uh, uh, integrate multiple functions into a single LRU still it is not possible to uh, avoid completely those uh, the federated LRUs okay till uh, the market comes up to speed and uh, goes completely IMA. So, so in order to facilitate that, still the IMA uh, cabinets had the interfaces, uh, which are legacy uh, federated uh, avionics interfaces. In the case of military, we discussed it was mil standard 1553. And uh, again, then the commercial world, the equivalent of that was the Ring 429 protocol. Um, which was used in the place of mil standard 1553b for uh, federated architectures okay so still there is a provision for the interfacing with those uh, um, the legacy uh, federated uh, lrus through the respective interfaces and again these are some examples from the civil world okay so the First one, first aircraft to implement the concept of uh, the integrated modular avionics was uh, uh, A380 platform. The Airbus came up with this uh, concept, so wherein um, they could uh, um, design multiple uh, um, IMA cabinets, combining the functions for uh, different uh, aircraft functional elements. So you can see the list of uh, functions that are combined into multiple. Uh, cabinets. So whatever is shown here, 
this is uh, this is how the the IMA cabinet looks like. So whatever the individual modules you see here, so they they contain uh, the dedicated uh, uh, the processor cards, okay, or uh, other uh, shared common resources like I/O or the power supply, and uh, they are all uh, connected through a backplane backplane bus, um, which is uh, embedded uh, as part of the chassis here. And uh, so when uh, Airbus introduced this uh, IMA concept for A380, so they also introduced a new uh, data bus interface, so which is called the AFDX, the Avionics Full Duplex Switched Ethernet. So this is a derivative of the Ethernet uh, interface that we use normally in the uh, industry, but uh, this has been customized and adopted for the requirements of aviation. So the primary drawback of the Ethernet technology, if you if you had uh, uh, come across uh, during, through your uh, earlier studies or experience, is its uh, non-determinism. Means you can't guarantee whether a given uh, data packet will be delivered um, uh, in a given time to a destination. Okay, so this non-determinism prohibited the direct usage of the Ethernet for the uh, avionics application. So the Air, uh, Airbus came up with uh, this AFDX definition, so which introduced uh, a new protocol layer over and above the existing Ethernet, so which could ensure the deterministic data transfer between multiple uh, uh, IMA cabinets or the multiple avionics units. So this is another example uh, from Boeing 777, so followed by uh, A380 success. Uh, so it was uh, adopted for Boeing 777 as well. So here, uh, similar to what we saw in Pay Pillar, uh, so there are two redundant common integrated processes. So in the Boeing terminology, they call it as Aircraft Information Management, Management System, that is AIMS. So there are two, uh, in this picture, there's only one such cabinet is shown, but uh, there is one more cabinet, so okay, which uh, provides the redundancy and also uh, it uh, uh, complements the functions provided by the uh, AIMS cabinet one, right? And uh, so these are some of the functions uh, that are implemented here. And again, uh, similar to Air Airbus, so like how Airbus came up with the AFDX uh, data interface, for uh, A380 implementation. So Boeing also came up, uh, means in association with Arink, they came up with a, a data interface protocol called Arink 629. So till then, Arink 429 was a dominant uh, data, a data bus, which was used for all the civil avionics systems. So the Arink 629 uh, came as a replacement. And uh, so it was also successful, but uh, due to various reasons, so it has not become popular and uh, uh, by the time the AFDX was uh, introduced and uh, adopted by many players, so Aring 629 lost its uh, significance. Okay, so now we have discussed almost uh, all the architectural concepts which have been implemented so far, or at least in the implementation stage, uh, up to third generation architecture. But so as we discussed, there are some challenges when we go for either a pay pillar or IMA. Uh, uh, one of the factors that we discussed uh, as the uh, avionics architecture drivers was uh, the budget and schedule, and the other thing was the long-term strategy. Okay, so so when you have the budget and schedule constraint, so it is difficult to implement the long-term strategy because the long-term strategy involves uh, a warm-up period, and auto, uh, it also incurs a lot of uh, money and time, right? Uh, so even for the IMA, so that was a challenge, main challenge. So since the federated architecture was dominating the avionics world for quite some time, uh, so the suppliers in the market, so they were all uh, uh, well adopted for the IMA-based LRU's design. Means all their products were uh, uh, designed for IMA architecture with uh, individual LRU boxes. So when the IMA was... Uh, sorry, the federated architecture. So when the IMA was introduced, which required all those uh, LRUs to be um, compressed 
to a single LRM, a line replaceable module or a single card. So it came as a, a big shock and surprise for them. Okay. And uh, so the big players like uh, Boeing and Airbus could uh, implement this IMA successfully due to their uh, uh, money power, right? Uh, but it was not possible for uh, other other small players, okay? And so even the the market was not ready for this. So it it became like a one-time implementation, even though it was successful. But slowly the market is uh, uh, getting adapted to that. So many companies are uh, uh, started developing uh, the IMA based. Uh, solution they are converting all their uh, existing Hi, products everyone. to the ima based solutions in order to support the ima based architectural implementation for the uh, next generation aircrafts okay so this is the last generation of uh, the avionics architecture okay and uh, i would call this as a futuristic as well um, so Again, this has been uh, derived primarily from the uh, pair pillar architecture, what we discussed, the, the baseline is same, okay? So, so I would like to highlight only the difference with respect to the pair pillar architecture. So, uh, sorry, pair pillar architecture. So in pair pillar, we had the common integrated processors, okay? Which were uh, primarily having the uh, data process and signal processors, right? And when we uh, spoke about the RF or the radio frequency uh, processing, uh, even though there was a first level of integration, it was again confined to individual sensors. For example, we had uh, separate RF cabinets for radar, separate one for uh, communication navigation units, and a separate one for the electro-optic processing. Okay, so whereas the in the pay-pace architecture, the integration was taken even to the RF and the sensor level processing. For example, uh, here you can in, you can have common resources for processing the uh, data or signal from multiple sensors. For example, you can uh, have the common processing elements both for radar as well as communication system as well as the radio navigation systems, right? So traditionally, if you see, uh, all those systems operate in different uh, frequency bands. So the, the gap is uh, very huge. For example, if you see uh, a normal airborne radar, it operates uh, in X band, which is uh, generally 8 to 12 gigahertz. Okay. Whereas if you see the uh, radio navigation system, they operate primarily in uh, 1 gigahertz or 2 gigahertz range. And similarly, the communication systems uh, they operate even in the VHF, that is a 300 megahertz and uh, upwards. Okay, so there is a vast difference in terms of the frequency bands. And if you see accordingly, the components, the RF processing components used for uh, uh, those uh, uh, systems, uh, they are uh, restricted or their performance is restricted for those frequency ranges, okay, traditionally. But with the advancements in the... Um, uh, semiconductor technology, uh, it was possible to uh, process a wide range of signals spanning over a, a larger band, starting from megahertz to gigahertz in the uh, same component, right? For example, you have a, a low noise amplifier as a standard component in any uh, RF system, which amplifies the signal coming uh, from the antenna. Right. So again, this uh, traditionally its operation was restricted to specific frequency, uh, frequency band or a very small frequency band. But with advancement, so we have the components, wide band, wide band components, which can uh, process the RF signals uh, uh, over a huge uh, bandwidth. Okay. And so even the antennas, if you if you had seen on the aircraft, so there are multiple antennas used for uh, different systems, which will be projecting outside in different parts of the aircraft. Okay, so the PayPay's architectures uh, uh, defined a framework wherein uh, we could do the integration even at the antenna level. Means the antennas are generally defined for, uh, again, like RF components for a specific small narrow frequency range. And uh, with the advent of uh, the wideband antennas, so the integration was possible even at the antenna level. 
right so it is possible now so we, like how we have the common integrated processes which were uh, shared by multiple functions so here we have uh, common or of processing elements which are shared by multiple uh, rf sensors or uh, rf systems like radar uh, communication radios communication navigation system and the same thing applies for the even for the optical systems okay so this way you can say the pave pace architecture took the level of integration up to the skin of the aircraft when you say skin of the aircraft the antennas are installed on the skin of the aircraft right so so even at that level so uh, they could achieve the common resource and resource sharing yes so now we have pretty much covered all the uh, generation of uh, avionic architecture and this is the summary of what we discussed so far okay and we started with the independent avionics then uh, moved to the federated avionics then came the integrated avionics then the last one advanced integrated avionics uh, uh, which we discussed with the uh, uh, pave pace architecture and the pave pace architecture has been currently implemented on the the most advanced uh, aircraft fighter aircraft in the world the joint strike fighter f35 okay so now having discussed uh, what is existing so what is going to be the future of avionics architectures what are the challenges so means uh, some of you are most of you might have uh, heard about the terminology called urban air mobilities so wherein we are talking about introducing the unmanned air system so we have not spoken so far about the unmanned uh, aircraft uh, during our discussion it has been uh, mostly uh, based on the manned aircraft but the unmanned aircrafts are gaining now uh, Uh, wider applications uh, in many fronts of our life, including military and civil. Okay, so their usage and the integration of them into the airspace is unavoidable in the future. So now, so we have to come up with the new technologies and the new architectural concepts when we talk about because their needs are going to be uh, unique. For example, take the case of air taxi applications. I mean, it's not yet been realized, but it is going to be uh, done. very soon right so the air taxis are envisaged to be uh, unmanned uh, predominantly okay and uh, so their size is going to be very small but so considering their uh, operations in the air space along with other manned aircraft and also with other air taxis and uh, uavs so means it needs to have almost all the capabilities of uh, uh, a normal aircraft the civil aircraft or uh, I mean, it need not be a um, military uh, capability. So, whatever the civil aircraft has, at least it should have. In addition to that, it should also have some of the capabilities which are not existing with the current uh, uh, civil aircrafts. For example, um, since it is going to operate in a very dense environment, in the uh, urban environment, uh, wherein uh, the number of UAVs or the air taxis are going to be very high. right so it needs to have a different technology to to avoid the collision so in the case of the manned aircraft so far we are able to manage with the legacy air traffic management system right but in the case of the futuristic uh, uh, air taxis so they need to uh, be able to protect themselves so further they need to have a detect and avoid sensor systems and okay so and the high speed data links so these are some of the key technologies so which needs to be incorporated or uh, developed for the uh, futuristic urban air mobility systems and so now coming to the avionics and the architecture what are the challenges that are going to face so as we discuss the scale of uh, the size of this vehicles are going to be small but at the same time we have to provide all the capabilities that we have for a bigger aircraft so so the solution here is the miniaturization of avionics okay so whatever avionics um, processes and other hardwares we discussed so we need to have a miniaturized version of those things but with the same capability okay so now the uh, industry is coming up with the concepts like uh, system on chips and system on modules wherein the entire the hardware functionality is implemented on a chip or a module in a um, very small space so this could be one of the future trends and we should also think about uh, the new architectures okay so whatever architecture we discussed they may not be directly uh, be implementable for these things so maybe we can take some uh, lessons from that but we have to customize them for 
the new the new avionics uh, systems and of course the uh, latency in the communication system for the uavs is a big challenge now so but when we talk about the urban air mobility we need to really have the high speed data links and uh, we should also have very uh, low latency okay so that's all about the avionics architectures and as i mentioned so i have just one slide on the uh, data buses that are uh, uh, popular in the uh, avionics community okay some of the data buses we already discussed as part of our uh, architectures okay so this is just a statistics which you might find even uh, through other sources uh, in the internet right but just to give uh, a brief summary about this the mil standard 1553 so this is this is the most uh, popular and uh, which is uh, still being used in the military avionics and aring 429 is again the equivalent of uh, 1553 in um, uh, the civil uh, aviation but again the protocol is completely different it is not same as that so this is the most popular one and widely used and even now it is being used irrespective of uh, it's uh, low speed and uh, other drawbacks okay aring 629 had a very short uh, life span as we discussed and uh, so now the current avionics uh, uh, domain is ruled by the afdx which was introduced as part of a380 okay and it provides a very high speed communication up to 100 megabits per second right and uh, so we also discussed about the hsdb which was used in uh, f22 and this is also a high speed uh, data bus offering 50 megabits per second and uh, we have uh, other uh, optical buses uh, which are not very popular but used in uh, few aircrafts and can bus is an interesting protocol okay this was uh, actually introduced uh, in the automobile uh, industry and then later it was uh, adopted for uh, uh, the aircraft applications okay so this covers our uh, main topic and uh, i would uh, i would like to take just a few more minutes okay thanks for your patience i think uh, we have taken really long time but uh, um, apologize because uh, the content that uh, this are the subject that we have taken up for the discussion uh, required uh, at least this level of discussion so for better understanding and clarity okay so a quick thank you thank you kishan okay uh, quick introduction about collins aerospace okay so i as kishan introduced uh, i work as a principal systems engineer for uh, collins aerospace okay and uh, this is a well renowned avionics company and uh, it is it has been formed by merging a lot of um, uh, popular uh, legacy companies starting from goodrich aerospace and hamilton sun strand um then rockwell collins okay so who were pioneers in their own uh, technological domains and uh, uh, products and systems okay so all these uh, popular companies were put together to form the collins aerospace just a uh, um, couple of years back okay and uh, so with the power and the, the product uh, ranges produ- uh, provided by each of these individual companies so now the collins aerospace is in a position to offer the products that are required from the nose to tail of the aircraft you name any product starting from the nose to tail of a commercial aircraft or a military aircraft so the collins aerospace has a solution okay and so these are the major product verticals are the uh, the products offered by collins so we have uh, products in the aerostructures uh, so just one of the example is the nasal which protects uh, the aircraft from the engine vibrations you would have seen the the cylindrical structure around the engine on the wings of the aircraft so that is one of the uh, prime products from the aerostructures products line avionics again so uh, whatever uh, sensors controls 
and uh, systems, integrated processing systems we discussed so far, starting from displays, communication radios, navigation systems. So everything is available with uh, uh, Collins Aerospace. Interiors, so again, uh, uh, so we also manufacture uh, the seating systems, lighting systems, okay, and the environmental control systems and all that. And uh, again, so we discussed the landing gear is one of the uh, prime element of the aircraft, okay? So uh, the landing gear system is a prime product line, sorry. Mission systems, again, we provide uh, uh, all the communication and um, uh, radar and uh, data link solutions for the uh, military customers, okay? And uh, so we are also uh, pioneers in the cyber security systems for uh, military. Power and controls. So again, uh, so this covers uh, whatever power systems we discussed, starting from the generators, power converters, and power uh, distribution systems, and all that stuff. OK, so this is just uh, a statistics about the Collins Aerospace. So we have around 70,000 employees all over the world in different countries, 16,000 engineers. OK, so under nearly we operate from 300 uh, sites all over the globe. OK, yeah, that's a quick introduction about uh, Collins Aerospace. And uh, I would also like to introduce uh, and uh, talk a few words about uh, the International Council for Systems Engineering. OK, so so whatever uh, the, the systems engineering process that we discussed so far for designing an aircraft or an avionic systems, which includes the design of architecture, Okay, so requires the involvement of a systems engineer. Okay, you, most of you guys would have heard about a hardware engineer or a software engineer or a materials engineer, chemical engineer, and all that stuff, right? So, but so when we discussed about uh, the design process of an aircraft, okay, so we started from the uh, the mission definition and mission analysis, and uh, based on that, we arrived at the capabilities for the aircraft. And from that, we define the functions. Then from the functions, uh, we identify the uh, systems that are required for uh, executing those functions. And again, the systems are composed of the hardware and software, right? So we need someone so who will be able to see this big picture, OK? Understand right from the uh, aircraft level and float down those uh, the requirements from the aircraft level to the individual systems level and also to the individual component level, like hardware and software, okay? So we call uh, such people as systems engineers, okay? Who are uh, generally uh, visionaries and who are able to uh, imagine and conceptualize things. And uh, so now, it is the right time for uh, having more systems engineers in India because the India is uh, slowly uh, transforming itself from a service-based economy to a product-based economy. So when you say product-based economy, so you have to come up with uh, new system concepts, okay, which requires a lot of systems engineers. And uh, so aerospace is definitely not an exception. In fact, so aerospace and uh, defense is... Um, uh, industry which introduced or pioneered the concept of systems engineering itself due to the uh, the complex nature of the systems that were produced over there okay so that context my suggestion to all the stu aerospace students and in fact all the students uh, and the practicing engineers would be uh, to uh, consider uh, pursuing your career as a systems engineer right so as an aerospace engineer you may be specialized in uh, uh, some of the domains, like some may be uh, specialized in propulsion, others may be in aerodynamics, others may be in controls, okay? So, yes, yes it is important, important to have that specialization, specialization but, but it is also, also uh, important to understand the big picture at the aircraft level, what the aircraft is supposed to do and uh, what is the role played by the individual components and systems within the aircraft, okay? So, uh, my uh, recommendation and our suggestion to all you guys is to consider pursuing a career in systems engineering, right? And uh, 
at only few institutions uh, uh, have adopted the systems engineering as a subject in their engineering curriculum okay all over india but so we have uh, uh, other options uh, for example so that is what i'm i was planning to talk about in these few slides okay so there is a, a international uh, body called international council for systems engineering okay which promotes uh, the um, discipline of systems engineering and practice of systems engineering all over the globe in the academia as well as in the industry okay and so they provide a certification course in the systems engineering which provides the opportunity uh, for the young engineers and also the practicing engineers to understand the basic concepts of uh, systems engineering and apply uh, in their uh, future uh, job or in their uh, ongoing activities for those uh, who are uh, already uh, in the industry right so so there are uh, two levels of uh, certificate actually three levels of certification offered here okay the, the last one will ignore now because it is for the experts and the senior level people okay so at the entry level for the students uh, the inquisi offers uh, the ascp associate systems engineering professional okay and for the practicing engineers who has uh, around 5 plus years of experience uh, the cscp that is a certified systems engineering professional okay and so these things will be definitely useful for you to uh, understand uh, the system what is systems engineering is all about and what are the different methods and techniques that will be useful for uh, defining new concepts and uh, developing architectures and uh, designing new systems okay and uh, so if any of you are interested in uh, pursuing this so okay we have a uh, in course india chapter uh, in india so this is a contact information of inquisi india chapter so you can uh, write to us in, in fact i am a part of the executive uh, body of inquisi india chapter so i will be able to help uh, regarding this uh, certification okay and you can also visit the website of inquisi for uh, more details to understand so that's all i had and uh, finally uh, this is my contact information so in case uh, if any of you have any further uh, technical queries or you want other information from my end so you can contact me on this but my request is uh, in case uh, if you want to um, uh, get some information related to the uh, career prospects with collins uh, then i would uh, suggest to approach through your organization rather than individuals if uh, a group of uh, people are interested and um, then you can uh, contact pollen zero space through your organization rather than writing to me individually so maybe you can ask one of your representatives to write to me on this email then i can connect you guys with the uh, um, uh, right people in collins other than that for related to the inquisi related queries or the certification related queries uh, you can write to this email what i showed in this previous slide in course india chapter or you can write to me as well personally okay thank you very much that's all i had from presentation side i think i took really long time i apologies for that but uh, i hope uh, it was uh, useful and uh, provided some idea about uh, avionics and uh, what avionics architecture is all about no issue sir it is a great uh, thing uh, which we have here uh, you have spent uh, much time with us because uh, most probably when we invite uh, people uh, they will be sharing and due to kind time constraint they will also short that but uh, whatever that uh, you have explained it is a new thing actually being an academician and uh, those who are from academic background it will be very much different for them uh, so it is a great pleasure to have you sir actually uh, again the same due to time constraint we cannot uh, able to go for uh, q and a so what i will do is uh, whatever the questions in the live chat i will compile that and i will send to you so if you have time you just revert back to me sir. sure kishan yeah, i can because, do that uh, yes sir so it's almost uh, 7 and 2 uh, hours Uh, many uh, people have uh, in the chat box also have requested 
so uh, we will uh, go for uh, vote of thanks so i would like to first of all i would like to thank uh, prasanna ramamurthy sir for accepting this and uh, you know that i have been following you from may for this one day session and it is uh, really a wonderful uh, opportunity to have you today with us and uh, next i would like to thank uh, our uh, aerospace engineering association from iit madras so they have collaborated with us for this uh, wonderful session and i would like to thank the coordinator and uh, one of the organization startup from iit madras tech table so i would personally thank them for uh, joining with us also and uh, at the end the participants nearly 1000 participants have uh, joined over here so uh, without them this event is not going to be a uh, possible so i would uh, like to thank them for uh, staying at the end also so right now we will go into the certificate procedure uh, i will share you the details in the screen so you can follow the step by step procedure for the certificate which you can collect from the platform called thems academy okay so it is on the screen kindly look into the procedure then you can able to download the certificate sure yeah Dear participants, kindly follow the step-by-step -step procedure over here. Um, we have shared the link in the chat box also, as well as we have sh shared the link already to your respective mails, registered mail IDs. So if you have any queries, you can contact us anytime. We will be available uh, through WhatsApp and uh, uh, all the social medias we are available. So you can use those platforms to connect with us. And uh, I would like to... Uh, inform few more things so we are introducing uh, the best coordinator award where uh, the faculty if you are a faculty member you can organize the next event with our uh, wings of arrow and uh, i request all the participants our next event is for space astronomy so space astronomy it is delivered by professor jay murthy from indian institute of astrophysics so it is scheduled on 36 2020 and at same time 5 pm so it was uh, organized along with atal incubation center kv air force chandigarh okay so i request all the participants to join over here and if you are a faculty you can go for uh, best coordinator award from society of aero you can apply today through www.societyofaero.org/coordinator so this is the opportunity for faculty only and uh, i request all the participants to join over our next event through the same platform so apart from that i request all the participants to subscribe the channel and with this
we are ending the session so once again i will run the certificate procedure for you guys so you can download the certificate from academy.wingsofarrow.com Yes, uh, apart from that, uh, I request all the participants that the web page might not uh, load since more than 1000 participants are there, so it may not load properly. So you can download the certificate for next 5 days at any time. It will be available for the next 5 days at the same link. Okay, So you can download at any time. In the next five days okay So with this we are ending the session and uh, I wish you all a good evening and uh, we can sign up with this last one slide repeating about the procedure of certificate. We have already shared in the link. The website may be having a uh, server error you can download the certificate at any time in the next 5 days